Hello, my name is Bian Webster, and today I will be talking about the introduction to U-Boot Bootloader. This talk was originally written by Marek Versat, and uh, essentially it is licensed under the CC by SA 2.0 license. Share and share alike. My main job is as an embedded Linux consultant, Linux kernel engineer, and trainer and course author for the Linux Foundation. And today we will be discussing uh, U-Boot and how it gets used in the embedded industry. So let's first talk about uh, bootloaders. Uh, bootloaders are generally in multiple stages, and indeed there's no different in the embedded world. Uh, basically, there's usually two or three levels of bootloader before we get to the Linux kernel. Uh, initially, there is the first stage bootloader, and this on SOCs in the embedded world typically resides inside the boot ROM of the chip itself. Uh, it basically takes the reset vector and tends to initialize enough of the hardware so that it then can read the, uh, the first user-controlled bootloader uh, from storage before it, it goes up from there. The next, of course, is the first user-controlled uh, bootloader. It's usually in several parts as well. Uh, it, is, it is fairly common to have the first part of that be what's called the uh, SPL or secondary uh, program loader. Um, now, in the case of U-Boot, this is a cut-down version of U-Boot that essentially initializes the rest of the hardware such that it can then lo load a more featureful version of U-Boot, uh, which would then load the Linux kernel from there. U-Boot, uh, uh, of course, beyond the SPL, tends to bring other uh, features and so on. Things like an interactive shell, boot monitor, debugging tools, the ability to mess around with hardware to test things and so on. Uh, the reason why we tend to have a separated SPL from bootloader is the SPL tends not to change much. It tends to just be enough capabilities in order to load the rest of U-Boot, whereas U-Boot itself, being a bootloader, much larger surface where problems can happen. The ability to upgrade or, or change U-Boot in order to solve problems in the field is typically very nice. So whereas one doesn't tend to want to change the SPL much, U-Boot uh, itself can sometimes be uploaded and uh, or rather uh, upgraded. This is what U-Boot looks like when it boots. And you can see here that the SPL has loaded first and then it's turned around and load, loaded a larger, more featureful U-Boot in order to do the rest of the work. Uh, it also shows you which CPU, I squared C, DRAM, these sorts of things, and then gives you an opportunity to drop into the command prompt. Uh, or it will start the default boot up sequence for the Linux kernel in this particular case. So press space and you get to a prompt that looks like this. Again, the SPL is a secondary program loader. The idea effectively is it's just enough of the uh, U-boot so that in fact it can then load a second part. Now this could be U-Boot itself, uh, a bigger version of U-Boot, it could be the Linux kernel, uh, it could be a tertiary program loader. In certain situations, uh, for instance on things like one NAND, sometimes it you need another level of bootloader to basically read extra information before you can get to the real uh, kernel, but TPLs aren't often used very much. Now let's look at the basic U-Boot commands. U-Boot has a couple of different options for its shells. There's the older original shell, which actually never had a name, uh, or there's what's called the Hush shell. The Hush shell was something that was ported over from BusyBox originally. Uh, it's a much better choice in general, just because it has more options. And indeed, we will be talking about the Hush shell in the rest of this uh, talk. Uh, it's very sim similar to the Born shell, so very much like a Unix shell in many respects. Uh, it does have a key value storage for environment, uh, which can be made persistent and indeed supports scripting, which allows for uh, failover and upgrades and other kinds of things if you so wish. You pretty much do whatever you want to with it. First of all, like any good command line, of course, there's a help. And indeed, if you type help and then press enter, it will show you all the various commands, their help and uh, what have you. Now, it's uh, pretty useful. And indeed, you can actually go one step further and get help on individual commands. You'll notice here that we've done help on echo, help on BD info, and it tells you what the commands mean and other kinds of information. Uh, also, if a command has subcommands, help is very useful because it will list those, what they do. Here's an example of the USB subsystem. So 
uh, you know, you could start, reset it, stop it, see a tree of it. So if you have USB hardware, you can poke around a little bit and see how it works. Now let's first look at the echo command. So just like any shell, uh, echo allows you to echo out, uh, you know, text and that sort of thing. Uh, unlike the born shell or, or any kind of shell scripting, however, it does not support control sequences like perhaps you're used to. The only one it does support is backslash C, which you have to escape. Uh, and that what, what that'll do is it will suppress a new line. So as an example here, you'll see that we've uh, echoed out hello world, and then we've echoed out foo, backslash, backslash C, echo bar, and of course it's pushed together foo and bar it, as a result of suppressing that new line. BD info is another command that allows you to look around the actual board itself, and you'll see here it prints a lot of the settings that are in, uh, that are uh, specific to this particular hardware. So, uh, what Ethernet device is being used, what the load address is, where DRAM is, all that other good stuff. So you can see all the sort of fundamentals of the platform that you're on, which is very helpful when you're trying to figure things out. Now, if you want more help. Uh, there's, in fact, of course, a website at uh, uh, denks.de. Uh, certainly there's a IRC channel on Freenet that you can go to. It's uh, hash u-boot. Uh, and, of course, there's the mailing list, uboot at list.denks.de. Uh, all of them are good places to ask for help. And, indeed, the uh, maintainers and sub-maintainers hang out on those places and can answer questions. Next, let's look at uboot memory access commands to see what's possible there. MW and MD. Uh, these are useful for reading and writing values to memory and registers and other kinds of things. Now, by default, it will actually look at a long, which is 32 bits, um, specified by the .l uh, postfix. However, you can make it 8, 30, uh, 16, 32, or 64 by using .b, .w, .l, and q, byte, word, long, and quad word. Uh, now, you can read multiple units uh, of, of things at a time by, pro by uh, providing a, uh, a length. Uh, the nice thing is, is that once you provide a length, the default for the next command is uh, replicated. And indeed, like anything on the command, if you press enter by itself, it will repeat the previous command. Uh, so it allows you to essentially uh, do a memory display and then press enter, and it'll just keep on incrementing through the addresses thereafter. So we show an example of that here writing a value, showing it, and then indeed just memory displaying through it, things thereafter with just printing, pressing enter. I uh, can also use some um, uh, toggle things like uh, uh, memory connected GPIOs and that sort of thing. Here we're giving an example of, of uh, playing with the, the uh, uh, GPIOs that run the LEDs on the board that we're going to be demoing a little bit later. So in this particular case, looking at the bit fields that, that uh, control these particular uh, GP, uh, LEDs. Let's look at memory access commands, memory write, memory display. Uh, in this case, we're showing you an example of toggling GPOs, GPIOs the hard way. These GPIOs are connected to blue LEDs on the platform we will be uh, demoing a little bit later. You can see that up here. Uh, but uh, this is how one can do it. So you can see how you can uh, basically set the GPIOs up and then indeed play with the values um, using memory write, memory display. We can also use memory modification commands. These allow a little bit more interactive ways of dealing with memory. So you can modify registers, memory ad addresses uh, by using uh, MM. Now MM is nice in the sense that it will auto increment as it goes through memory. Uh, by starting at a particular address, you can enter values and then press enter. It'll take you to the next offset and it'll keep on doing that until you press Q. If you want to go back, you can press the, the uh, minus sign. But otherwise, uh, if you merely want to not make a change and skip a line, you can press enter. But it allows you to wander through, through memory and uh, make changes as you go. And then on the other hand, does not. It just says the one entry and then that's it. Uh, you can also copy memory so you can you know set values for instance like we've shown here uh, copy memory somewhere else and then indeed you can compare two different areas and so here you'll see we're giving an example of comparing memory between two addresses it will show you what's the same what's different and so if you make a change it will in fact point out what that change happens to be next let's look at uboot environment and scripting commands 
So the environment in Uboot is purely a key value storage. It lives in RAM, there's a live value, uh, live version rather. Now originally it's read from the Uboot binary that it comes in, however it can be overwritten with a stored or persistent storage. And so it will start with a default version, look for uh, updates, and indeed what you get in memories is therefore the uh, co combination of the two. If you make changes, you can of course save it so that the next time you reboot, it'll take you back to that. Uh, so modifications can be made, they can be saved, they will survive reboots. However, if you don't save them, you go back to the values you had from before. So first of all, let's look at printing uh, values. Now there is the older printenv command. Uh, it is an alias for the more up-to-date versions of that. Uh, env is, is a uh, command that has a number of subcommands, one of them being print. So whether you do an env print or a print env, in fact, you will get the same output. So here is an example. You'll see that if you type env print, it will print the entire environment table. It'll show you the size at the end. If you want to just env print one of them or print env one of them, like arch, for instance, it will just show that one thing. And of course, if you want to just see the value of something, you have to echo whatever that uh, the, the dollar uh, variable name is, uh, as, as you can see on the slide here. You can also set values uh, with set env, or the newer version, of course, is env set. And so if you env set foo to bar, of course, when you do an env print of foo, it will show you foo equals bar. Uh, you can also uh, ask to set values. And so if you set, uh, if you say env ask and then the name of a variable and then a prompt, in fact, it will print the prompt. You can then type in the value. When you press enter, it will assign the value to that variable. So an example here, we have cook set to one, two, three, four uh, as a question. And then indeed, if you print it, you can see that cooks equals one, two, three, four. Uh, you can also edit a value. So env edit, give the name of the variable allows you to type in the new value. When you print it, of course, it will be the new value. When it comes to removing variables, uh, in shell, you would normally type unset something. In uh, uBoot, you just set it to nothing. So you say env set and then put no value. It will, in fact, delete the variable as a result. Of course, you can also save uh, settings. Normally, when you make changes, uh, they will be wiped out during the next reboot. However, if you save your changes, and you can save to, to raw NAND or to a file system as a file, whatever, however it's set up, but once you type save env and then reboot, any changes you've made will persist and essentially will, will uh, come up the next time you boot up and go back to the command line. So you can change settings interactively, which is quite nice. Of course, we can also run variables as if they were scripts. So whatever you type at the command line, you can put it into a variable. And then when you run that variable, as you can see in the example here, it will do its thing. Now, semicolons can be used for separating um, commands. And so you'll see here that if we put two commands in a variable separated by a semicolon, it's if you, as if you typed one, press enter, and then press the other one again. So here, hello world on the next line. Variable expansion is also something you have to be careful of when you're using scripts. Uh, bear in mind that that uh, if you just include a variable in a script, essentially it will be uh, expanded immediately. So here is an example. We uh, set foo to bar, and then we set uh, cooks uh, to echo dollar foo. Now in that case, it will actually be expanded. So you'll see if you set foo to a different value and then run cooks, see that it is actually set to bar because it was originally expanded during that set end. However, if you do, if you escape the dollar sign, you'll see that if we do an env set of cooks echo backslash dollar foo, uh, this time, of course, when we print cooks, you'll see that the dollar foo has not yet been expanded. Uh, when you print that, in fact, the appropriate value will be expanded at the time. So just bear in mind, you sometimes have to escape the dollar to make it work appropriately. There are also a uh, number of uh, special variables in the environment table. Uh, things like ver, which is set at boot time to show you the, the version of uBoot that you're currently running. Of course, things like standard in, standard out, standard error. These are all the sort of standard uh, standard I.O. things that you, you're used to. Uh, things like load adder. This is the, the default place where uh, things get loaded by the, the, the various uh, things uh, commands that read from disk or from 
you know, Ymodem or TFTP or what have you. File size is a variable that's set whenever a file is loaded into memory. It's automatically set to the size of what was read. Uh, boot args is used to pass arguments to the Linux kernel at the command line. So we need to set that before we will boot appropriately. Uh, there's another vari a variable called boot command. Now this is the default boot command. When you just type boot, it actually turns around and calls run boot command. And this indeed is what gets run automatically if you don't press spacebar to get to the command line. It's also a pre-boot script. Now this runs before we start to auto boot. It allows you to set up things like uh, uh, you know, the console appropriately or what have you. Next, we have net network settings, things like IP adder, which is the local IP address, net mask, right? You expect what that is. Server IP is typically the uh, uh, IP address from which we either got our IP address from DHCP or where we will TFTP something from if, if we're using that technology. And then we have the gateway IP, of course, is of course the, the gateway for, for the network connections that we have. Uh, our Ethernet MAC addresses, of course, can uh, we, have, may, we have more than one. Those are also stored in our environment table. The set expert command is, is a bit like the EXPR command in, in shell, normal shell. Uh, it supports a, a very narrow set of commands, however, uh, basically some arithmetic commands and some uh, logical things like AND, OR, or XOR. Uh, this basically allows you to do different things to, to modify variables. Here, here we have an example, for instance, of displaying a value at a particular address. And you'll see here we are um, dereferencing that value using set expert and putting that into a variable, in this case, into foo. And then you'll notice that we can print the value of foo. We can also set variables to different numbers and then, for instance, add them or subtract them or divide them, what have you, as an example here. It also allows you to do very simple uh, substitutions. So in this particular case, you'll see that we're taking a, uh, a regex, basically a, a, a pattern, and we are replacing it uh, in a, a, um, a string. So you'll see here that we have A, A, B, B, C, C. The pattern we have is A, B plus, which means A followed by one or more Bs. And we're saying replace that with an X. And you'll see we go from A, A, B, B, C, C, in this case to A, X, C, C, based on that command. Next, let's look at shell conditional expressions and loops. So here we, of course, can use just the straight up true and false commands like we'd see in regular shell script. And indeed, the dollar question mark uh, gets uh, set to whatever the return code of the previous command is. So true will, of course, set the return code um, to zero, as, you, as one would have in on the command line. Uh, a normal born shell command line and false will set it to one again as, as one would expect. Conditional expressions, uh, of course, uh, you can use things like if and while, uh, if true, uh, rather if condition, then else, uh, phi, same as in shell scripting, we can do those kinds of things. So as an example here, if true, then hello, else, echo by, right? fi that will print hello however what you cannot do is you cannot do the inverse of something you can't say if not foo okay if not true for instance so a work around for that is in fact to always use the else command so if uh you know if something then false else and then put what you would have uh, uh used in your your then otherwise in that second piece so it's not great but it does work and indeed another way of doing it is an expression or something at the command line that also works. We have a couple of examples of how to do that here with or and and just to show you how that's possible. Again, it works just like on uh, a shell command, a born shell command. We also support test, uh, which is a, a limited version of what came from hush. So of course we can say things like less than, greater than, equal, uh, greater equal, all that other good stuff. Uh, and again, you can mix this with uh, ifs and while loops and so on and so forth. And again, here's some examples of how that uh, all fits together. Uh, here's a for loop. And indeed, again, it works just like the Born shell. Uh, you'll see here that we have a sequence here, A, B, C, D, and uh, I will be set to each one of those values. And indeed, uh, the uh, loop part of this, the do echo dollar I, will print out each one of those in a different line as one would expect. While loops, again, work just the same way. Here's an example of, uh, you know, 
while true do echo hello endless loop the way you get out of that was with a control c that will take you back to the command line again just like uh, you were doing regular shell uh, programming next is uh, uboot data loading commands and uh, you can load things from all sorts of different kinds of storage we can do this from uh, you know, SD cards, USB, uh, storage devices like SATA drives, NAND, uh, you know, all sorts of different kinds of things. And you can do both raw storage or indeed uh, support for different file systems. Many file systems are supported, things like uh, the straight up DOS VFAT format, sadly not uh, XFAT, uh, but there is the EXT file system, the, the Linux file system is supported. Um, UB and UBFS and newer raw NAND uh, formats are also supported. Unfortunately, SquashFS is not supported, but just generally speaking, you'll find that uh, the, the, the universal file system access commands, things like ls, load, and so on, will auto detect file systems and then run the appropriate uh, subcommands of the, the various uh, file systems otherwise, which is rather handy. So here's an example, for instance, of, of uh, using an SD card. Uh, managed by the MMC subsystems. Doing an MMC rescan will basically look for cards or uh, eMMC chips that might be available. You can, of course, print the partitions here. MMC part will show you the partition of that thing. Uh, you'll notice we, when we do an LS, uh, we have to specify the not only the subsystem we want to go to, but also the device and the partition. In this case, you'll see we're doing LS MMC 0, so device 0, 1, uh, colon one rather which is the first partition so so ls mmc zero one list the first partition on the um, first uh, sd device that you find and in this particular case you'll see that it we see that there's an id.txt file on it uh, we can then load that into memory you'll notice we if we type load mmc zero colon one uh, load adder is the address we want to load things to and then the name of the file it will run the appropriate load file system command uh, for that partition and load that file into memory at load adder and then set the file size. So you'll notice that on the next line when we do a memory display uh, of a, a, a byte dump of that, that file, we get the load adder, we get file size, it will basically do a hex dump. In this particular case, you'll see it was a, it was a uh, text file so we can see what was in it in, from memory. We also support um, network commands. Now, uBoot only supports UDP protocols. So things like uh, TFTP, NFS, DHCP, BootP, uh, DNS, right? And if so, some of those protocols uh, do support TCP, but not under UD, uh, not under uBoot. Um, so we can do all those sorts of things. So things like uh, reading files off TFTP or NFS, that works. Certainly getting uh, an IP address over DHCP or BootP works, uh, ping, uh, some I ICMP is supported, very, very handy. You'll find that TFTP and DHCP are, are largely linked. Uh, TFTP by itself will just TFTP a file, DHCP, or at least getting an IP address from DHCP uh, in infers that you also want to TFTP. So it will auto load something from whatever server it gets an IP address assuming there's a TFTP drive on it as, or a server on it as well. Here's an example of, of optionally setting uh, your MAC address. Theoretically that's in your environment already. Uh, you'll see you can set your IP address statically. Uh, if you don't use DHCP, set your NetMask, your, the server IP. Uh, this would allow you to ping it. Of course you could also TFTP something from it or indeed DHCP which would get an IP address and then TFTP uh, as well. And again, you'll notice that we're going into load adder. Uh, you can also load over a serial port. This is a bit old school, but sometimes we have no other options. And so uh, since we're using a serial port to get to the command line, uh, we can use things like X modem, Y modem, S records, Kermit, uh, all sort of the old ways we used to do these things all the time before we had ubiquitous uh, network connections or, or USB. So as an example, for instance, if we type load Y, we'll start up uh, the Y modem protocol, we can then use uh, things like the SB minus T command from 
uh, LZRZ uh, SZ, uh, package in order to upload things. And so, for instance, if you're connecting over screen to the serial port, as uh, many people do, uh, once you type load Y, if you then press control A and then exec bang bang SB minus capital T and the name of your binary, it will then load it appropriately. Alternatively, you can open another shell and you can run screen minus X minus R capital X and the, basically the same command. Don't forget to escape the, the two bangs. Uh, the reason why we can do this is because screen allows you to do concurrent access. So the minus X basically connects to the same screen session and uh, will load your binary that way. So that also works. Next, we'll talk about booting the kernel. Okay, presumably you're, you're booting Linux with U-Boot, although it's possible to boot other things. Uh, but Linux can be basically wrapped in a couple of different ways. We can use a raw uh, Z image, okay, which allows you to uh, load a kernel that's been brought in from uh, just the raw build. Uh, Linux, of course, it self decompresses into memory, and so we can just use that. Uh, the big problem here is there's no CRC or other kind of hash uh, checking for uh, problems, so no bit rot protection. Uh, it just basically dumps it into memory, and we jump to it and hope, hope for the best. Uh, it does support optional device tree, certainly in the case of uh, we can either pass one in or one can be uh, appended to the kernel if we support that. Uh, but generally speaking, it basically works like it would work on any any uh, machine. Now, uh, originally U-Boot supported the uh, U-Image format, and uh, it's been around since the beginning. Uh, the nice thing about it is it was a nice wrapper around uh, an uncompressed uh, kernel, and indeed could implement its own compression. Um, these days we don't use that because kernels are self-decompressing. Uh, CRC32 checksums are always used, so we could see whether the, the, uh, the kernel is in fact valid. This is great when you have more than one uh, kernel uh, due to upgrades or what have you. Uh, but the old U-Image format would only wrap a single file. It does support an optional device tree, but you'd have to provide that separately. However, on newer systems, and uh, by newer, it, this has been around for a while, and that's something called a fit image. And uh, fit images are nice in the sense that they're, they're kind of like uh, tar files, if you will. They're multi-component images. And uh, the nice thing is, is, is um, uh, is they allow you to describe multiple uh, internal files. Um, so you can, for instance, package up a kernel, a device tree, configuration, and other things all in one file. In fact, better than that, you can do more than one kernel if you need to. Uh, perhaps you're supporting more than one platform. Uh, so these are all things that are possible. So it's based on the same device tree format. Uh, it does support multiple different files and in different versions of files, potentially. Uh, you can uh, program which algorithms you want to use for file integrity, uh, it supports digital signatures, there's all sorts of, of reasons that one would want to use it. Now going back to booting from a, uh, a Z image, uh, for that you need to use the, the boot Z command and uh, indeed that will allow you to make that work properly. Uh, we also have boot I, now this will allow us to, to boot an ARM64, AR64 uh, image, uh, boot M, uh, was originally designed for the U image command, but in fact will automatically detect fit and do the appropriate thing there as well. And then of course you've got the boot command variable. It details what the default way of booting up happens to be. And indeed you can learn more about all these different things by using the help command. Next we'll we'll, we'll see what uh, booting a kernel uh, kind of looks like. You'll see here that we're setting our, our boot arguments. Uh, in this case we're setting our console. Uh, and baud rate. Uh, one might also want to set the root file system, root file system type, and so on, but whatever you need to pass to your kernel is, is done here next. Uh, you'll see that we're also loading a kernel here, in this case uh, into the 82 million uh, address from the first partition on the first MMC device. Uh, so in our second line here, you'll see that we're also loading a device tree, in this case for the pocket beagle, uh, into memory, again at a known location, and then finally running boot Z, passing in the address of the kernel, dash for an optional uh, initial RAM disk, which we're not using in this case, and then the final address is the address of the, of the flattened device tree. You'll notice that it finds the, the, the uh, FTT, the uh, DTB file, uh, loads it, and then it starts the kernel, and we see it start up. Device tree just really fast, and there'll be a talk on this a little bit later, um, essentially describes the hardware. 
the, the reason why we have it is because in embedded we often have hardware that cannot be uh, enumerated or uh, detected through normal means and so we have to describe what everything is and how it all connects so this tends to describe everything that's in our reference manuals and on the schematic of the, the product that we're building device tree is an acyclic graph uh, it has a, a series of nodes and uh, nested nodes and properties that essentially describe how everything fits together. Uh, each node represents a specific thing and each property describes aspects of that node or that, that thing that it's describing. Uh, nodes can es essentially uh, contain not only properties but also child nodes and so you can actually have a hierarchical set of of uh, devices and settings that allow everything to fit appropriately. If you want to learn more, there's a link here to the Wikipedia uh, page, which then points to all the different specifications and, and the, the website and so on. There's also the ability to uh, basically have pointers to other places within the, the uh, device tree, and these are called P handles. They're references to labels that, that label other nodes. And so for instance, you might set it to uh, in an angle brackets ampersand L2, that would take you to the L2 label on whatever node it, it was associated with. And what that means is that we can basically link anything to anything else, which of course gives us that acyclic graph as opposed to a strict tree. So here's an example of a device tree. You'll see we have a version one device tree here. Uh, we've got our include at the top, uh, device trees in the Linux kernel are run through CPP, so we use uh, pound include. Uh, here we have a few different things that are listed. You'll see we have CPUs and what have you, but it shows you roughly how it all fits together. So this is the format of, of device tree. Uh, and here's a fit image, and you'll notice it uses the same format. So device tree version one, all the different uh, uh, properties, and then the different nodes with the different properties set, as one would expect. So similar uses the same uh, parser and that sort of thing to make things work properly. Here you'll see that we have a kernel that's defined to be loaded from a particular location in our build. Uh, here we have a um, flattened device tree, same deal, being pulled in from a particular location. Notice we specify the algorithm for doing uh, file integrity and that sort of thing, whether or not it uses compression or what have you. And then here at the bottom we have our configuration that ties the kernel to the flattened device tree, the hash algorithm, tells us what it is, right? And you can see how there'd be a possibility of having more than one configuration within the same uh, fit image. Notice at the bottom, this is how we compile it into the binary fit image. So we take the uh, ITS file, which describes where all these things come from. We run it through make image and it will spit out the fit image binary, which we can then load onto the device. So the fit image commands, if you want to load, uh, load that and boot from that, you run boot M and then the address of the fit image. Basically everything that's required is in there. It knows what's kernel, what's configuration, what's um, device tree, basically everything uh, works appropriately. Uh, nice thing too, is that when you type IM info, it will basically tell you what's going on in there, tell you what the OS is, the load address, the kernel image, you know, all, all the different metadata about it is, is quite nice. And uh, you can also extract information from, from fit images. So I am extract will allow you to pull things out of it and indeed to look through it. Uh, of course, one can then use uh, MD, the uh, memory display command. Uh, U-Boot also does support flattened device tree from the command line. So you can uh, both print and manipulate and change and add and delete things from the, the uh, flattened device tree once it's in memory. So. Uh, for instance, uh, here's an example of loading that device tree and then uh, in this case making, uh, you know, printing out some stuff and uh, seeing how it all fits together. Again, one can add to it, uh, see what's there, and then of course ultimately boot from it. Uh, the idea of course with U-Boot is that one can read the flattened device tree, perhaps make changes to it during a script before passing it on to the kernel. So it completely understands that. Next, let's look at some miscellaneous U-Boot uh, commands. So we can also get all the different kinds of, of hardware that happens to be there. So things like GPIOs, so we can uh, effectively uh, do all the sorts of things one would expect. We can read GPIOs, set them, clear them, toggle them. This allows us to essentially mess around with external devices, both inputs and outputs. Uh, and indeed, we'll be showing how this works a bit later. Uh, we'll be playing with some LEDs and some push buttons in, in the demos. 
I squared C uh, also has commands for it. So uh, we can wander around on, on the bus. We can uh, essentially read values from memory uh, on the I squared C bus. We can probe things. We can uh, set the bus speed, do all you know, kinds of things one would expect to do in drivers. We can do from the command line in um, uh, U-Boot. And so we can essentially play with the hardware before we boot our real operating system and even use this in, in um, manufacturing or debugging when we're first putting bo boards together. Next, let's look at compiling U-Boot from source. So you can get the source code from a Git, and indeed there is a, a, a Git repository at danks.de. There's also a, a mirror of that on GitHub, so you can get it from there as well. Uh, the custodian trees are also available. Uh, at all. These are the places where essentially they're the, the sub-maintainers, if you will, for, for U-Boot, so they all work together. And uh, indeed you can get it over Git or HTTP, so uh, that all works appropriately. Um, so it's a little bit like compiling the kernel in the sense that it has a series of, of def configs. You set cross compile in order to cross compile it. Uh, but here you'll notice we're cloning the, the, the uh, U boot code. Uh, we're then setting cross compile in this case because we're compiling it for ARM, just as an example. Uh, we're setting the uh, default configuration in this case for the Sitara chip that's used on the Pocket Beagle that we'll be using in the, in the demo and uh, building from there. Uh, now, We'll also see that U-Boot does have a sandbox version that you can run uh, on, in user mode to, to play with the commands without having to run it on real hardware. And in fact, there's also QMU uh, um, targets and other things as well that allow you to play with it. So it, it runs in a number of situations where you can play with uh, how it works. And on that note, let's get to some demos and we'll play a little bit with things. And again, we will be using this setup here, um, this board, it is a pocket beagle and it is on a tech lab base. And this will allow us to play with some of the things that um, allow us to uh, see how they work. You can find more information about the pocket beagle on beaglebot.org and indeed tech lab as well. You can buy them from the normal places. You can find the slides, these labs and the solutions at the following URL. And when you get the slides for this, uh, you will be able to uh, give this a try. So let's go through this and start from the beginning. So first things first, we are going to go to the command line and we are going to connect to it using, in this case, screen. Uh, the uh, USB serial port that we're gonna be using is TTY USB zero. And indeed, if we look at we'll see that it is in fact there and indeed it is because we have connected this USB port here that uh, we have access to the serial console. So uh, we have to, of course we also have to specify the baud rate so we'll do that and I'm going to reset the board so you can see it boot up and there we go and so you'll see there's the SPL and there's U-boot popping up. Indeed if I type help all the different commands. Press enter again, of course, it'll run it again. Uh, I can run help echo, right? Help uh, I2C, you see all the different commands that happen to be there. Okay, so that's the first lab, get to auto boot. The next thing we're gonna do is we are going to uh, try to boot a card from the SD card. Now, if I just run boot, this, this board will in fact board boot all by itself uh, but instead, what we're going to do is we are going to try and do it uh, ourselves from uh, just typing in commands. And indeed, what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut and paste here. So here I'm going to set the root file system. I'm going to set the console. And like this. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to type MMC rescan. Okay, I'm then going to load the kernel. There it goes. And then I'm going to load the device tree. And so here we go. Just cutting and pasting so I don't make any typing errors. There we go. And then we are going to boot the kernel. Uh, 
no initial RAM disk, and then the flattened device tree. And so when we boot that up, there we go, kernel comes up, and indeed we start up until we get to the boot prompt. Let's take a second. And come on. There we go. And indeed, if we type in the, you'll notice that the username and password are specified right there. Okay, and here we are. And indeed, if we look at proc command line, You'll see there is the boot arguments that were passed into the kernel. Okay. So next thing is we're going to, so that's, that's the next command. You'll notice that this, the solutions are also in the, in the uh, slides. Next, what we're going to do is we're going to boot the kernel uh, from the SD card with an adjusted device tree. Okay, so basically what we're going to do is we're going to make a change to the device tree as we boot. So we're going to reset the board and drop back to the command line. And so what we're going to do now is we are going to um, replace a change in the um, flattened device tree. And so MMC rescan. And then we're going to set the boot arguments again. Okay. And then we're going to load the kernel again, because of course we lost it when we rebooted. There's the kernel. We're going to load the flattened device tree again. Okay, but this time what we're going to do is we are going to make a change to it. So now what we're going to do is we're going to type FTD adder 0x88. This is the address we loaded the flattened device tree into. Okay, so if we do a um, uh, FDT list, we'll see there's the device tree. All right, so what we'll do is we'll Go up there, and you can see the different values, right? You'll see the model is currently set to TIAM335X Pocket Beagle. Okay, and what we're going to do now is we're going to type FTT set model hello world. Okay, so now when we run FTT list, let's see now the model is set to hello world. So now when we do the boot z 0x82134, now when we boot, there we go. So up at the top there, you'll see that the model number will, will have been uh, printed. We'll just wait for it to boot. And then what we'll do is we will log in and we will look at dmessage to see what it was set to, just to make it a little bit easier. There we go. And if we now do a dmessage, and grep for model, see there it is, machine model, hello world. Okay. Again, I'm going to reset the board and go back to command line and we'll go to the next lab. Next, what we're going to do is we're going to play with the GPI input command and uh, we're going to try and read the value of a button. Now, the way we're going to do that is we are going to um, basically write a little command here. Just like this, echo button not pressed. And we're going to press enter. Now, you'll notice we're not pressing a button, so button not pressed at the bottom. We're now going to take 
and press the button that's here and rerun the command. Now it says button pressed. Now I'm gonna let go, run the command, not pressed. Button pressed, there you go. So reading that particular thing, we just, in this case, we happen to know that GPI uh, 45 is in fact that button from the device tree and uh, indeed from the schematic of this particular board. If you look on the website, it will show you uh, what GPIOs are connected to what. Next, what we're gonna do is we are going to blink a uh, the LED. There's four LEDs on here, four blue LEDs right here that happen to be off at this particular point in time. And the lab here basically gives some ideas of how these things work. So what we're gonna do is we're going to set up the, um, the LEDs appropriately, set up the GPI appropriately. And then we are going to do little command here. So what we're going to do is we're going to set up a while loop. We are going to set our uh, we're going to set a particular LED. We're going to sleep for a second. We are then going to clear that LED. Okay. And then we're going to sleep one again and we're going to finish. And so if we look up here, this guy's right there. Notice that it blinks on and then off, and then on and then off. Right there. And we press Control C and it stops. Notice it's now off again. Okay. Let's look at the next one. And we'll look at uh, task number five here. And so here we are going to. Um, play with uh, the, the LEDs again. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna turn them all on. So these are uh, GPIO 53, 54, 55, and 56. So instead of playing with the memory uh, addresses directly, we're going to use the GPIO command instead. And so the way that works effectively is, again, we're just gonna write a quick while command here. And we are going to do a for loop and GPIO set dollar i. We are going to sleep for one second. GPIO clear. Now, let's watch right here. What this is going to do is it's going to turn on the first one and then off, the next one and then off, the next one and then off, and the next one off, and then repeat. So look right up here, and there we go. As it marches up, bottom two, three, four. Okay, up there, of course. Okay. And of course, Control C, and it will stop where it was at that time. All right. Next, we're going to look at uh, loading something via Y modem to see that work properly. Okay, and to do that, what we're going to do is we are going to first leave, oops, we're going to leave screen. And what we're going to do is we're going to create a file. And what I've done already is I've created a file on slash temp called m.txt and in it I have hello equals world and foo equals bar. Okay, I'm going to reconnect using screen. All right, and what I'm going to do here is I'm going to run the load Y command. And what this is going to do is it's going to load something into uh, the address of load adder. So here we go. It's going to run control uh, Y modem. Then I'm going to do a control A colon exec bang bang SB for uh, Y modem, strangely, uh, capital T minus capital T, and then slash temp slash env.txt. And this should, there's a knack because it took me a while to type. There we go, and it got sent and it got loaded. So now what we're gonna do is we are actually going to do a memory display dot byte of load adder. Oops, load adder rather. 
uh, file size, which is now set appropriately. And you will see that it says hello world and foo equals bar as we would expect. And then indeed we can do a env import to bring it into our environment if we, because we can do that, right? And again, file size, this will essentially read it as if we're sourcing a script at the command line and right. And so it's actually read it in now. And now when we do an env print, oops, print, hello, you'll notice that that is set and indeed env print foo, foo equals bar. Okay, whereas if we reset, notice that env print foo, not there, env print uh, hello, also not there. So we made those changes, we did not persist them, and indeed when we rebooted, uh, away we went. It disappeared and you see that it was not set. Next, what we're gonna do is we are going to uh, build U-Boot in sandbox mode, just to give that a try. Okay, and uh, the way we're gonna do that is we are going to come over here. Now, I've already checked out, uh, cloned uh, rather U-Boot. Um, uh, here it is, I've got this uh, straight out of, um, straight out of uh, Git, so I did that first command already. Uh, once in U-Boot, what we're going to do is we're going to do a make sandbox def config. And what this will do is it will actually create a configuration file for U-Boot to run in user space. Uh, not as a bootloader, just as a, just to essentially allow it to run as a regular program. So you can do just simple uh, operations there and debugging and such just on the, the default non-hardware facing stuff. Uh, next, we're going to build it, and we're going to do this by doing a make minus j, and we're going to speed things up by basically using all of our processors, and proc tells, uh, returns the number of CPUs I have. And so when I run this, it'll run a parallel make, and build U-boot. When we're finished, in fact, there will be a elf version of U-boot that we can then run at the command line. And uh, although we can't use it to boot anything, uh, it will in fact allow us to play with all the sort of regular shell things, uh, which basically means you can essentially write commands and scripts and things without having to have a real platform. We could, we could have similarly done this sort of thing in QMU. Okay, it's almost there. There we go. And so now you'll see we have a binary, right? There's a U-boot binary there. You'll see that is in fact a uh, runnable uh, x86 64-bit uh, device. And indeed, you'll notice that it looks just like we're booting a real uh, platform, but of course, we're just emulating this in user space. And you'll see that we have a uh, environment table and all the sort of normal things one would expect. A lot of you just poke around inside there. Okay, and when you're finished, you can just do a control C, I'll drop you back to the command line. Okay, the next thing we're gonna play with is some string manipulation using set, set expra and uh, or sex, set expression rather. Uh, that's how you say it. And this will allow us to mess around a little bit with uh, a scenario. In this case, the idea is that a value has been read in, let's say using a barcode reader, something that sometimes happens during uh, manufacturing and uh, essentially something comes in as a string that doesn't actually look like a MAC address and we wanna make changes to that string so it it fits as a MAC address. Now, the assumption in this case is that our separators can be either an X, a Y, or a Z. And so the idea is to write a script that can handle that appropriately. So the idea here is that, first of all, we ask for whatever that thing has to be. In this case, we're gonna use env ask. Okay, and the idea is that a barcode reader might then, oops, put 
that in place. Okay, so now when we do an env print Mac, you'll see that it's not set appropriately. Well, in order to make that work, what we might want to do instead is use something like this. This will take, um, this run this pattern, which basically looks for uh, the, the separators, right? One or more instances of, of the separator and replace it with whatever's uh, basically with uh, colon. So here it'll, it'll replace it with the colon like this. So two values and then the separator will be replaced by the two values and a colon. This will basically take 00x and replace it with 00 colon and will do for all those different situations. So what this means now is you'll see that my um, eth adder is now set to a proper MAC address with all the x's replaced by uh, a semicolon or uh, by a colon rather. All right, so just playing with a little bit of string manipulation. And finally, we are going to play a little bit with the accelerometer, okay? And uh, this is an I2C device on the Tech Lab. It's built into the, the card here. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna use these commands in order to make this happen. And again, all the solutions for this are in the labs. And so uh, here we go. We are going to, oops, I2C dev2. All right, and then we are going to set things up appropriately. Um, that command essentially sets up the uh, the address that we're going to be talking to. Um, we need to wake up the accelerometer so it works appropriately. And then what we're going to do is we're going to start reading the accelerometer information in a while loop. And that will, oops, did not cut and paste that appropriately. Uh, so we're gonna read it in a while loop really fast. Now that's gonna go like this, and it's hard to read here, but look at this right here. As I t tilt the board, you'll see it changes. Okay, now if you look at the ASCII values, it's a little bit easier to see, but you'll see if, as I do this, see how they change? That's because the rate of change, because of the accelerometer, basically when it's not moving, nothing changes. If I change it to on its side here, you'll see that the values that are read from the accelerometer change with it. It's harder to see that way because they're not printable characters, but there you go. See the orientation. I'm only looking at one of the axes in this particular case. You can see how that works appropriately. Okay, and there's lots of other things one can play with. These are the things we came up for this particular uh, talk. And again, these are the kinds of things that one would normally be doing if we were doing this in person. We'd be playing with these directly in this particular session, but unfortunately we couldn't do that here. Uh, you can, in fact, buy your own versions of these. Uh, certainly there's a little bit of uh, soldering involved, but this baseboard and the pocket beagle, uh, you can source these two together, uh, locations at the, the uh, URLs that I posted earlier on. And indeed, these labs can be done uh, based on that. Thank you very much. And we are now, uh, now can take some questions. So I hope everybody enjoyed that. Um, and uh, certainly I'm open for questions now if people want to, uh, to ask them. I've been trying to answer them as I can in the uh, Q&A um, uh, text box there, but uh, certainly if people want to ask more questions, I can answer them through voice. Uh, just to go through some of the the uh, questions that were asked during the the um, oh more questions sorry never mind. Lots of questions. There we go. Uh, one of the questions is, is how are people getting the Linux to boot up in one second? Um, 
So this depends on a number of different things, but there's no simple answer to this. Uh, anybody who's been going to ELC for a long time will know that there's been lots of talks on how to make things uh, faster. Uh, the big thing about booting uh, your, your platform very, very quickly is essentially making sure that the uh, straightest path to being uh, booted essentially is followed. Uh, that tends to mean a lot of hard coding. It tends to mean uh, very little flexibility. Uh, indeed, it means essentially jumping straight from, uh, it means having as, as minimal a bootloader as, as possible. It means having as as uh, short of a, a boot up path as possible. And uh, quite frankly, in, in some situations, it, it also uh, means cheating a lot. Uh, amongst other things, what do you consider uh, booted up? Uh, does, does that mean that you can see the, um, what looks like the control panel, let's say on a, on a touch screen, or does that mean it, it's actually fully functional? Uh, for instance, I uh, worked on a head unit for a car at one point, and uh, the way we got around a lot of those problems is during the boot up sequence, the U-boot, uh, rather the, the, the bootloader at the time, which was U-boot, uh, would throw up a splash screen that looked like the booted system. Uh, for instance. And so it took people uh, a few seconds before that actually touch it, or if they did, it just looked like it was lagging. Uh, basically, things were coming up behind the scenes. So even though we had something that looked like a, a, a startup screen, in fact, it was still booting behind the scenes. So you'll find there's an awful lot of things people do to uh, make things come up appropriately. In some cases, you can boot up very quickly. In other cases, there are other techniques. Uh, but uh, minimally getting the things that people care about running before anything else is usually the technique. Uh, very few things actually boot in one second. They, they just get up to a point where they appear to be running in one second. Um, so hopefully that answers your question, uh, Jason. Uh, another question here. Uh, are there built-in methods to access encrypted file systems? Uh, generally speaking, uh, so I don't have a good answer for that. Uh, I, I would say generally no. Um, the thing is, is that to a large degree, I think normally what people care about more in bootloaders is that your... Um, uh, that a secure boot is, is more important. So there are certainly ways to deal with signed kernels and signed um, initial RAM disks and, and, and such. Uh, but uh, uh, as far as encrypted side of things, that's typically handled by Linux as it, as it comes up. So um, I could be wrong there, uh, but to, to my knowledge, directly accessing an encrypted file system from within U-Boot, I've personally never done it. So it may be possible. I'm not aware of that being possible. Uh, perhaps it is, and and I'm sure patches are, are accepted. Bear in mind that uh, uh, U-Boot has a very strict policy on GPL only co code and uh, non-patented things only. So you'll find that a number of things uh, in that realm, in fact, cannot be added to U-Boot as a result. Um, are there SPI CAN commands uh, like you are at Nice Word C? Uh, there are indeed SPI. Uh, I'd have to look. I, I believe there's CAN. I haven't actually played with that. Um, but certainly there are SPI commands as well. Uh, there's also SSI and hope, basically choose a, a subsystem. There's probably a command for it. So you can actually deal with a lot of things uh, directly that way as well. Does U-Boot support USB? Yes, it does. Uh, in fact, it, um, it can do quite a lot. Uh, in this particular case, the example we're giving, it does not support the USB uh, port we have on this particular board. Um, uh, where is it here? So it doesn't it doesn't support this specific uh, this one here. Um, however, it could. It's just a matter of the, the default U boot doesn't have support for for the tech lab directly. Um, but uh, indeed, uh, it it certainly can support uh, USB. Um, in fact, booting over USB is the uh, uh, is is one of the things that one can do uh, directly on this board um, using the, the effectively the gadget driver. Oops. Um, what else do we have here? Uh, are you using Ubuntu as your primary OS? Or can you? So um, actually what you're, uh, uh, for, for the demos I do here, in fact, I was using Ubuntu in a VM. So certainly you can use a VM. Uh, Ubuntu uh, is actually surprisingly common in, um, in embedded Linux work. Certainly most of the companies I go to, the vast majority of them are using Ubuntu um, either in VMs or uh, natively. 
Uh, that doesn't mean you can't use anything else. It doesn't mean that it's necessarily the best distro for all the things, but certainly it works rather well. I use Ubuntu in all my classes that I teach uh, because it's it's literally the 90, 95% of, of what the people I deal with use uh, in the embedded industry. Um, now, using it within a VM causes extra complications, but it certainly can be done. You just need to know your hypervisor extremely well to make it work. Um, uh, next, uh, Fernando, uh, looking a bit into the use of NFS on U-Boot, I haven't... Hello, everybody. I don't know what happened there. I was told to reload my slides, and so I did. Uh, not slides, my uh, browser, rather. Um, let's see you now here. So I'll just go back. Uh, NFS used uh, in U-Boot is primarily used for development. Uh, in development, we don't care quite so much about the uh, credential side of things. Uh, I personally haven't played with credentials, certainly there. Uh, when I'm using NFS uh, from U-Boot, uh, usually it's as uh, NFS root uh, for the kernel. And in those cases, you're on a, a very uh, unsecured network in the first place. So I tend to make sure that I always have it set over a very short piece of ethernet or um, uh, you know, a, a virtual network. So um, essentially credentials in NFS usually aren't used very heavily uh, other than development. And again, you tend to be on a, a protected network at that point. Hopefully, one only you can access. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that's it. May be able to do it. I personally have never done it and never needed to. Uh, what is a U boot linker script? Uh, so, uh, I think what what you mean by that is the linker script used to link U boot itself. Uh, linker scripts are used to put different uh, parts of code and and uh, read only data and so on from the kernel uh, at specific addresses within the bind the resulting bind binary. Uh, and so the linker script effectively describes what goes where in memory uh, and therefore in the ELF file so things can be loaded appropriately. Um, linker scripts are typically only cared about by people who care about the compiler or indeed uh, systems level programming like when you're building a, a bootloader. Uh, but to a large degree, if you're just extending U-Boot, you just leave it the way it is. The, the vast majority of, of people uh, don't need to understand how it works. However, uh, if you look uh, at any .o file or library and run it through nm or objdump, sorry, rather, uh, you'll find that it's broken down into individual pieces, uh, sections they're called. And uh, if you look through the linker script, in fact, it will describe what sections go where in memory. And uh, that's, that's all a linker script is, whether it's for the kernel or for user space or whatever else. It's just that we, in user space, people tend to use the default linker script. For, for U-Boot, it's uh, typically per architecture, and in some cases per board, depending on where memory is put and that sort of thing in the, in the design. Um, what else do we have here? Does U-Boot have access to Linux file system? Uh, so that's a, a pretty broad question. Uh, can it have access to the Linux file system? Yes. Uh, does it? it? It depends on how you set things up. Um, certainly, depending on where it is, what, what medium it's in, 
what file system is being used uh, might be, it may or may not. Uh, certainly if it's using uh, a FAT file system or uh, on a medium that can be read by the U-Boot, uh, if it's EXT2, EXT4, um, if it's UB, uh, UBFS, for instance, uh, there's a number of file systems that are supported and can be read. Uh, and in fact, that's used very heavily. However, uh, that does not mean all things are supported. So for instance, U-Boot cannot directly read SquashFS. SquashFS can be used by the kernel, but may not be able to be, uh, access, rather, uh, isn't accessible from U-Boot uh, before the kernel starts up, for instance, as an example. But otherwise, yes, you can load and save files to uh, things like FAT, EXT2, EXT4, and so on. Next screen. How large is a typical U-Boot these days? My last experience with... Uh, I need more in information there. Uh, what architecture, what board, what features do you want? Um, the SPL is quite small and it itself is a U-Boot. So if you wanna turn off all the features, it can be relatively small. Uh, the instruction set also matters. So a 64-bit instruction set, your U-Boots can be twice as big as if it's a 32-bit one, for instance. Um, lots of variables there. So uh, it's still it's still in, in the uh, megabyte, you know, megabytes range. So the smallest ones can be relatively uh, small, you know, a quarter quarter meg megabyte for basically no functionality and, and a very, very small processor. Uh, the SPL is r roughly that size. Uh, for uh, an actual, the, the, the U-boot bootloader side of things, it, it can be, you know, on the order of a megabyte uh, or bigger, depending what other f features you want in there. So uh, it's by no means uh, itty bitty, but it's by no means huge. It's nothing like the size of the kernel, for instance. But again, uh, basically there's too many variables. I can't tell you exactly how big. Uh, I can talk a little bit about driver porting, like the older version to a newer one, um, some pitfalls. Uh, so if you're using U-Boot, remember it's GPL uh, V2. And so uh, if you are putting code into U-Boot, um, uh, you need to upstream it. And if the, if the code is upstream, then essentially it will be dragged along with it. Hopefully there is no porting to be done. Um, but uh, just just bear in mind that that it is GPLv2. You are linking things directly into U-Boot. So um, as far as porting things, it, it's something that can be done publicly on the mailing lists. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't want to get too far much further into that because... Um, uh, that there may be other things going on there. Um, off topic, what is the Git extension in the shell uh, when you built U-Boot? Oh, you're talking about my, my shell prompt. Uh, look up, uh, just um, Google Oh My Bash. Okay, there's a, the, the original one was called Oh My Cash, uh, the K-Shell, but Oh My Bash with dashes in between, uh, you'll find... Uh, a whole lot of, of interesting things for making your prompt look pretty like that. And it's not just a get thing, it supports all the things. Uh, is the difference between device trees for U-Boot and the kernel, or are they the same? Uh, in theory, the same. In practice, uh, the changes made inside the kernel and the ch changes made inside U-Boot uh, can be different. So there is some coordination, but not uh, completely. If, if you uh, if you've got an embedded Linux engineer who doesn't use U-Boot together and um, an embedded U-Boot person who doesn't do a lot of kernel work together uh, and have them talk, you'll find that there are differences. But in theory, uh, in theory, they should be the same. In practice, uh, both are moving uh, at slightly different speeds. So um, uh, the, the older stuff is largely the same, but uh, there, there are indeed differences between the two uh, in some situations. Can you explain how to cross-compile U-Boot? Uh, cross-compiling U-Boot and the Linux kernel are essentially the same. Uh, you specify your cross-compiler and your architecture that you want to build for. Uh, so uh, we do it in the labs and the slides. You specify our, uh, arch equals and um, cross-compile, which in, in which case you, you specify the uh, what's called the, um, the prefix of the, the compiler. So when you're, you're running a cross compiler, you'll notice that it's, um, for instance, ARM, Linux, GNU ABI, HF, dash, GCC. The bit 
prior to GCC is called the prefix. And so you set cross compile equals that bit with the dash at the end uh, when you compile. And so instead of using GCC, it will use the ARM Linux GNU BIHF dash GCC version instead. And that's basically it. Otherwise, it's just like building the kernel cross compile. It's, it's the same mechanism. Um, a lot of the same people work on both projects. Uh, what else? Oh, thank you very much. Uh, what are your thoughts on applying device tree overlays via U-Boot? Is this feature ready for prime time? So overlays, um, there's at least one person on the call that probably or might still be on the call who have, have better uh, uh, opinions on this, but essentially overlays in uh, in Linux are, are still problematic. There's still lots of different things that are that are being thought of, uh, thought of to make things work there. Uh, the nice thing about um, applying overlays in U-Boot is it's kind of the original way all this was intended. Uh, U-Boot was really the place where you were supposed to play with flattened device trees before we booted up into a static uh, device tree uh, setup. So uh, I would say overlays in uh, U-Boot are very much the original intention. Uh, not so much overlays, but modifying the uh, flattened device tree during boot up before restarting the kernel was kind of the, the whole idea. Uh, so I think that's a really good idea. It, it sidesteps a lot of the problems that people have with uh, live changes later on when the kernel's booted. Um, certainly before we boot, we have lots of time to do those kinds of things. Uh, the bootloader can make any changes it wants. There's no security uh, from what it can and can't do. So it's really a good time to do it. So uh, making changes to the flattened device tree before we boot the kernel uh, is kind of a, a, a really good way of doing that. Exactly how it's implemented, of course, changes depending on who does it. So uh, that has not been standardized yet. But uh, as far as a good idea is concerned, yes. Does it support all the use cases? No, it does not. So, um, you know, we still have a ways to go. Uh, is it ready for prime time? Th theoretically, yes. Um, exact The exact implementation you use, everyone does it slightly differently still. So, um, but if you if you make your changes uh, using just a straight up uh, U-boot uh, script, absolutely, there's there's nothing wrong with that at all. That's completely ready. Uh, as as far as uh, overlaying a DTBO file, uh, you certainly can do it. Uh, Beaglebone is a really good example of how that's uh, how that's done. Um, or uh, yeah, and, and you know Raspberry Pi, other people do similar kinds of things as well. Uh, what else do we have here? Uh, can we have a live process after bootloader during the kernel and system boot for responding some systems input signals and maybe write on the same buffer? Uh, I think what you're asking is whether or not you can have two different things running at the same time. Uh, something running from U-boot and the kernel booting at the same time. Uh, in general, no. Um, in practice, one can use... Uh, there are various techniques on ways of splitting cores off to run different operating systems. So uh, things like, um, uh, perhaps not jailhouse, but but it, uh, if you were to bring up, let's say, a hypervisor and starting the kernel and something else at the same time under a hypervisor being booted from you, but you could do that. But uh, without involving other software, no, you cannot. Uh, like I said, theoretically possible in practice, not just with kernel and U-boot. There's other things involved to make that happen. Can U-boot interact with a TPM? Uh, I don't know the answer to that question. I'd have to look. Um, uh, at a guess, I would say it probably could. Uh, I'm not aware personally of, of whether that's possible. There, there's, uh, there are other people who are more, uh, they can probably answer that question better. Uh, does U-boot support sec uh, secure boot? Uh, there are certainly aspects of U-Boot um, that, that, can, that can build something like Secure Boot. Uh, whether it supports exactly Secure Boot, uh, I've personally never done it. Uh, again, there are other people who can better answer that question. Um, but cer certainly you can do things that, that approximate U-Boot, uh, Secure Boot, Secure Boot, pardon me, uh, through uh, um, checking signatures and such. Does U-Boot support boot over PCIe? Again, I don't know. Uh, th th these are all starting to get in, uh, out of beginner range and in, into more advanced ranges. Um, uh, certainly, I, I'm aware of platforms where they have done that. Uh, 
I, I'm not sure whether it's it's directly um, directly supported. Uh, generally speaking, uh, the way that works is is that the the boot monitor on the other side of of PCIe tends to uh, put what you want into um, memory at the appropriate place, and then you can read that from the U boot on the the platform you're on. So uh, certainly certainly there are aspects of that you can do, but exactly how that works, I, I haven't personally done. Uh, I've heard that Bearbox is way better than U-Boot. Can you explain why? Uh, <laughs> so, so Matt, I just want to ask which um, which uh, text editor you use. This this is very much uh, an Emacs versus uh, VI thing. Uh, uh, a lot of a lot of the reasons that Bearbox originally existed, um, uh, uh, U-Boot now does many of the same things. So it's it's really a, an either or situation. But thank you very much for the question. <laughs> Remind me to ask a similar kind of of question during your talk. <laughs> Uh, Mohammed, uh, do you know about any industrial application where U-Boot has been added, uh, used as an RTOS, although just as the bootloader? U-Boot <laughs> has quite a lot of features like some open source RTOSs. Uh, U-Boot is not an RTOS. Uh, let's be very clear about this. It is, it, it, it has never been and it was never intended to be real time. Uh, it is a bootloader and a bootloader only. Um, if somebody wants to use it as an RTOS, uh, there are far better options than than um, the U-Boot. I, I, I agree that it, it appears to have many of the same qualities, but it is not an RTOS. I would not bet the farm on that particular one. Uh, so uh, could one do that? Uh, I worked for a, a company at one point who basically used it for the, um, we, we manufactured the entire platform from U-Boot. And so all sorts of extra code uh, was scripted in there to make that all work from U-Boot. And so we very much used it as the OS during the manufacturing process to do what needed to be done. Uh, but uh, it really isn't a good fit for that. I, I wouldn't suggest it. So no, I, I would suggest uh, not not doing that. Again, there's far better, better options. Um, any resources where I can learn how to customize U-Boot for custom boards? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by customize. Uh, do you mean porting the code so it runs on a particular board? Or do you mean changing the scripting so it, it does the appropriate thing at boot time? Uh, typically, support for a particular SOC is your starting point. Um, and then anything you need to do specifically for the hardware that's underneath you can do in scripting. Uh, so um, uh, resources, r really all the normal places, uh, the website, the mailing list, um, and that sort of thing. Specific uh, resources, um, I can't think of any specific ones. Can the Beagleboard be programmed directly with Mac OS Terminal? Uh, so this is specific to a particular dev board. Um, none of the dev boards are specific to using Linux as the, uh, as the host uh, connection. Wherever you want to run a a uh, terminal server uh, program. Uh, I use screen in the demos. Uh, if you're on uh, Windows, you could use uh, hypervisor, not hypervisor, um, hyper terminal or whatever is currently used now, um, putty, I suppose. Um, but yeah, there's there's nothing you could, you, you, from, um, from Mac, you can use screen, you could use um, whatever, I think there's a program called Serial that you can get. Uh, there's a lot of different options, but yeah, it, you, you, you have to build these things on Linux, but as far as accessing the serial port um, side of things, yeah, you can do that from any operating system. We just use the BeagleBoard because it's what our hardware kits that we would have used in class would have uh, been otherwise, uh, had we all been uh, physically present at this conference. Uh, I like your setup for presenting the embedded, uh, what tools? It's, it's OBS. It's a straight up open broadcast system. Uh, I've got a green screen behind me, and I uh, don't know if I can show that. No, I can't. Okay, I don't have that set up. But um, yeah, it's just a straight up stream deck, um, uh, you know, some some lights and, and a green screen it's, and, and OBS. That's pretty much it. Uh, can you boot verify images before loading them, i.e. using signatures and keys? Uh, you, you certainly can do that. Yes, that, that is possible. Uh, where are you reading the questions and comments? It seems like there is another chat window. 
Um, no, I'm I'm looking at the the Q and A uh, the Q and A box uh, where everybody's a, a, uh, asking their questions. Uh, so yeah, it's not a chat; it's it's the Q and A. I'm just reading the questions and then answering them by voice. And that seems to be all of the questions I currently have in the queue. Uh, so if anybody has any other questions, uh, now is the time to ask them. Okay, going once, going twice. All right, I'd like to thank everyone very much for uh, attending. I hope everybody enjoyed um, enjoyed the talk, got some answers from things, and uh, I uh, I hope that um, everyone has uh, fun playing with U-Boot and uh, getting you know getting their projects working the way they want to and. Uh, um, remember that you can do most things from the scripting. You don't have to write C code for all these things. I've seen far too many people try to uh, try to, to to script their boot up in C. You do not need to do that. Okay, look at the scripts that are there. You can do almost everything from the command line. Anyway, thank you very much, and um, uh, enjoy the next uh, talk.